take me there. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I can always tell we're getting down to the end of the semester because there's more and more absences. This class is supposed to be packed and there's almost nobody here. And this is actually one of my favorite topics today because we're going to talk about products liability. And I think this is one of the most interesting areas. And it's obviously one of the areas that we think of as being clearly within the domain of marketing. Some of the areas that we've talked about in this class are not traditionally what we think of, you know, in terms of employee relations being within the domain of marketing, but have become part of the domain of marketing when we recognize the fact that we need to bring value across all aspects of the firm. And marketing is the only one that does that because it's the only fully integrated function of the firm. But clearly products issues are within the scope and domain of marketing and part of traditional marketing ethics research. So <clears throat> this is one of my favorite class periods and it's always at the end and students by this point in time are you know stressed, they've got other projects due and they have to skip this class. But it's actually one of the ones that's the most fun to talk about in terms of sort of the discussion that we can have because the topics are so interesting in terms of things that we've seen in terms of market failures in the past. So I'm going to start, I'm not going to use the, the, the topic that's in the current textbook. I'm going to go back several editions and talk about uh, one that was in the textbook probably like four editions ago, but I think it's one of the ones that's absolutely the most fascinating that I've ever, uh, that I've ever had to talk about. And so I use it over and over and over again, because it really does highlight with a great deal of precision, for example, the differences between teleological ethics and uh, duty-based ethics or deontological-based ethics in, in many respects. You see a clear and sharp contrast when we talk about pharmaceutical marketing between the two approaches to ethics. In some instances, you're going to get a lot of overlap between duty ethics and teleological, deontological and teleological ethics in terms of the results, because you could you can you know see that the greatest happiness is actually also going to produce you know um, a duty that that is recognizable that you know like for example you shouldn't lie in advertising. Lying is bad. Kant says lying is bad, but you can also find utilitarian responses that would say, look, if you lie to people and you don't tell them about the product, if you lie in advertising, it leads to ultimately bad results. People misuse the product. They don't, they don't get the product that they need and it leads to bad results, right? So you get, you get an overlap, but when we talk about actual product development, you can see in many instances, a sharp contrast between these two approaches to ethics. And one that I think highlights, you know, really interesting debates between ethicists of these two different different camps. So the product I want to talk about is called diethyl stilbestrol, and this is a pharmaceutical drug that was manufactured um, in the 1970s, I believe. So most people are not like me. I think I've alluded to this before in this class. I do not want to have children. I have never had a child, don't want to, never had any desire to have one. They make me nervous. And they require an enormous amount of investment. My brother always said that he wanted to have 12 children until he had one. And he realized how expensive it was to have one. And all of a sudden, he decided that maybe he didn't want to have 12 children. And he was going to stop at one, but his wife talked him into another one. And they had a second child. And, you know, he's, he's convinced now that that's more than enough. He thinks that in order to put his kids through college that he has to have a million dollars for each of them in the bank saved. And that's his goal is to, and he's, he's working rapidly towards achieving that goal to give his kids a million dollars each. And I'm like, well, where do you think your kids are going to go to college? And he's like, well, they might want to go to Harvard. And I'm like, nobody pays for Harvard. Nobody pays. If you can get into Harvard, nobody pays for Harvard. So I don't know where you think they're, you know, like if they're going to go to UT Austin or something like that, they're going to get scholarships. They're both bright kids. But he's convinced that you got to have a million dollars. So he wants to have kids. I didn't want to have kids. Most people want to have children. That is the desire that most people have. And it's, you know, it's probably a good thing that most people are not like me because the species would cease to exist if, if everybody was like me. Having said that, 
for people who can't have children, this can create an enormous amount of anxiety. Most people want to have kids. Now, with regard to female infertility, there are sort of two broad types. There are various causes that lead to infertility in females, but there are two sort of effects. One is women who just have a hard time getting pregnant. They just don't seem to be able to get pregnant for a variety of reasons. My, my sister falls into this category, although hers is self-induced. She has, she's been a marathon runner her entire life. She's run the Boston Marathon several times. And as a result, her body fat is so low that she cannot get pregnant. She, she's just, she has such a, she's got something like, I don't know, five or 6% body fat. They, they can't, it's so low, they can't even really measure it. So she's not been able to get pregnant. A second problem that some females can have is not that they don't conceive, but that they spontaneously abort the fetus. They shed the uterine wall. And this one is particularly traumatic for people. You know, you get pregnant and then you have a miscarriage. They came out with a drug called diethylstilbestrol, DES, in the 1970s, which helps with this second form of problems with pregnancy in terms of female infertility. And what it did was it allowed or it caused the body to not shed the uterine wall and allowed these women who have this problem to carry the child to term. Years later, after these women had taken this drug and they had had children, the children developed the female offspring of these women, not the male offspring, but the female offspring of these women developed strange types of cancer, strange and rare forms of cancer that led to death. And so they trace this back, all of these women that you know are having this strange kinds of cancer. And the one thing that they found that they all had in common is that their mothers had taken this drug to ensure pregnancies or to ensure that they were able to carry a pregnancy to, to term. And naturally, because we're a litigious society, who do you think these women who have this cancer sue? They sued the drug manufacturers of these drugs. <clears throat> now, the reason that this highlights some of these problems with both these two approaches are that you get different answers depending on whether you use a deontological or duty-based approach or utilitarian approach. So Kant says, for example, that we owe duties to rational beings. We owe duties to other sentient beings that are rational. Now, in Kant's time, they couldn't imagine, for example, that animals had rational thought. It turns out that they do. Right? We're, we're finding more and more studies that, that suggest that animals have enormously complex societies, particularly mammals, and that they communicate in ways that we never thought before. We thought that human beings were the only ones that communicated. They have now done, I have these prairie dogs, and we've done all kinds of animal rescue, and currently we have these two prairie dogs. National Geographic and the state of, I think, Utah has done studies on these creatures. And it turns out that they are capable of communicating far more. So with advanced computer technology and using algorithms, we can decipher animal codes in, in much greater detail. And so it turns out that prairie dogs communicate using both adjectives and adverbs. 
And the way they know this is they will have an experiment where they'll send someone through a prairie dog town. That's what they're called. These things that they live in are called prairie dog towns. And they'll send a guy through for several days and he'll do the same thing. He'll wear the same clothes. He'll walk at the same speed and they'll send him through and they will record what the sentinels of these colonies are saying. And it turns out they're pretty remarkable from two respects. First respect is that they all say the same thing. When they pass along a code, the prairie dogs get it right. How many of you, when you were in you know, elementary school, played this game called telephone, where you sat in a circle and your teacher told you something, yeah. you put it in the ear of the first child, and then you went along, and at the end, what was said is nothing like what it started out as. When they look at the vocalizations of these prairie dogs in these towns, it's exactly the same. They're, they are recording and transmitting this among the colony and they get it right 100% of the time, which is rather remarkable. Human beings can't get it right, you know, like any of the time when you do that. The second thing is that they notice that these vocalizations, that they can discern that they're talking, that they can tell, for example, if they send a fat man or a thin man or a tall man, they do this. They switch the, the, the players and they'll monitor these. And they, they, so these, these animals are speaking with adjectives and adverbs. They'll say whether it's walking quickly or slowly, things like that. Rather, rather remarkable. So Kant says that we only owe duties to rational beings. And now we're probably going to have to think about what we consider a rational being. But clearly, a future generation for Kant and the categorical imperative is not a rational being. Now, this can lead to some problems for duty ethicists if we're only going to limit it to rational beings because can we say, for example, that future generations have rights? Well, according to Kant, we, we, we can't necessarily. So some duty ethicists have, have said, you know, one of the problems that we have to have with Kant is that we have to think about maybe expanding our duties beyond just rational beings. But historically, the categorical imperative applied only to rational beings which he uh, defined as human beings, and it wouldn't say that we could apply it to future generations. The problem with DES is that this drug affects future generations. These women took this drug in order to get pregnant, and it impacts a generation that's not yet born. And then when they get pregnant and they carry it to term, then years later, it was almost 30 years after, these women start to develop these strange forms of cancer. And then they sue the drug manufacturer. Under a, a theory of liability called strict product liability. Strict product liability evolved in torts from a utilitarian perspective. It's purely utilitarian. So at tort, historically speaking, what we had in tort law was a theory of negligence. Negligence is predicated on duty. So in order to be found liable at tort historically for a product, you had to have a duty. You had to have a duty to manufacture the product for its ordinary purpose and use. And before we had negligence, we had something called the theory of caveat inter. This is also based on utilitarian principle. The idea behind caveat emptor is that 
buyers should be aware of what it is that they're purchasing and they should take reasonable concern in order to make their, their decisions in the marketplace. And this worked for most of human history pretty well because consumers were able to evaluate products fairly easily because most products were pretty simple for most of human history. So again, if we go back in time and we think about these eras of marketing thought, the oldest era of marketing thought is what we call the production theory of marketing. And in the production theory of marketing, the idea is if you build it, they will come. This comes from a movie called The Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. If you have something, people will buy it. And the idea was that we're going to let all these products into the market and that will produce the overall greatest amount of happiness because people will get to try the products and those products which people don't really want or need, they will, they will not use. And most products were useful and so it, it allowed for you know, people to, to maximize their utility in terms of economic terms and achieve the greatest happiness by putting all these products out there and people had the ability to buy what they wanted, what they needed. And that worked really, really well for most of human history when we could evaluate things. If you went back in time again to, to we're coming up on April 22nd, which is 89ers Day in Guthrie. I serve on the city council in Guthrie. This is a celebration that commemorates the land run of April 22nd, 1889, when the unassigned lands were opened for settlement in what had been what had been set aside as Indian territory. Um, and they then opened these unassigned lands for, for non-Indian settlement or non-Native American settlement. And they did it in a single day using a land run. People lined up north of the Cimarron River, they fired a cannon and they ran for, for plots of land, right? So travel back in 1889 was generally by horse and you could sort of evaluate the horse. If you grew up in that time period, you could go out and you could look at the horse and you could tell whether or not that horse was sway backed or whether or not it had, you know, problems with its feet and, and you could, could evaluate that. And then the first cars came along, Henry Ford builds his car and we could probably, the average person, you know, could understand the workings of that, that vehicle and, and ascertain whether or not it's relatively safe. You know, it's a fairly simple combustion engine, you know, four wheels. It didn't go very fast. But the modern car, can you all understand modern cars? I mean, how many people actually work on their cars? Nobody. In order to work on your car, you have to have a computer to be able to tell what's wrong with the car. And it's enormously complex. And we now travel, you know, how fast did the Model T go? I don't know. 20 miles an hour, you know, that's better than a horse, but you're not likely to have, you know, major accidents. So caveat emptor works really, really well when we can, when we can evaluate the goods and determine whether or not they're going to be dangerous. <coughs> How do you know whether or not this device is going to be dangerous? In the early ages of cell phones, people started getting some brain cancers, and they said, oh, it's because I'm using this device near my head, and, you know, it's causing electrical waves and things like that, and maybe that's leading to brain cancer. How do, I mean, can we evaluate that easily, the safety of this device? This device has led to all kinds of safety issues that we'd never thought about. When I was a kid in high school, it was the early era of MAD, and MAD stood for Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And that was a major issue. Now, if you are involved in a car wreck, the first thing they do is not, the, the insurance companies don't start looking to see whether or not you're drunk, it's whether or not you were on one of these devices. This is one of the leading causes of that, texting and driving. And actually studies show that it's not just texting that's bad, it's almost any distraction narrows the range of your attentiveness. 
And so the effects of this device go way beyond just the ability to communicate with other people. How do we evaluate that in this era? Well, these women took this drug to have children and the children then developed cancer. And using a theory of strict products liability, we've gone from caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, to strict products liability, where we're going to hold these drug companies liable for the cancer that these women suffered years in advance, or years after the um, years after their their mother took this drug. Now, when you do that, literally, what are you saying? to the drug companies and to society as a whole about this drug. I mean, when you when you sue because you say I got this cancer that was caused by this drug that my mother took when I was and we've now we've now determined by the way that all kinds of things we never thought about this in the past. All kinds of things cross the placenta and affect the baby. Things that we never thought about in the in the past. <clears throat> When my mother was pregnant with me, now she didn't do this, but you know, women drank and smoked. And I was born in 1973. People drank and smoked back then when they were pregnant. Nobody had any idea that that had really negative consequences for children. What happens if, you're, if your mother drinks heavily while you're pregnant? Well, you could end up with something called fetal alcohol syndrome. But let's think about this drug that these women take. What are you saying when you sue the drug company because it's caused you to have cancer years after your mother took it so she could carry you to term? In essence, what you're saying is I should never have been born. Right? That's the argument that you're making. I should never have been born. How do you measure this? Is your like, degree of suffering worse than your will to live? I yeah. I mean, how, how how do you how do you come up with a calculus for this? Would you rather have not been born? Some of these women died. Some of them lived but they went through horrible suffering, as I understand it. By and large, on the whole, aren't you better off having been born than not having been born? Yeah, but were they under the like promise that they would be, like were the mothers under the assumption that their babies would be healthy throughout their life? Well, okay. But any child that's born, the mother isn't guaranteed that their kid would be healthy for all of their life. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's lots of things that we've got that that affect, you know, whether or not you have a healthy baby. We now we now know that smoking and drinking are bad. Although there was an economist who decided she just liked a glass of wine, so she was going to do the studies and see whether or not there was a, a high probability of having a child born with fetal alcohol syndrome if she had a glass of wine with dinner every night. And she determined that the, the percentage was so small. And she wrote an article about this. And all of these women just like jumped on her. She, she releases this article. It was like, you know, the chances of my kid developing fetal alcohol syndrome from having one glass of wine a night is almost nothing. So I'm going to do it. And there was just this overwhelmingly bad reaction to, to this life choice that she made. And... You know, I mean, what we know now is far different than what we knew in 1970. In the 1970s, when we do tests on drugs and things like that, we're talking about probabilities. And every drug has the potential to have negative side. Everything that you do, they're going to determine that breathing causes cancer at some point, right? I'm not going to give that up anytime soon, and it does. The, the number of pollutants in the air, you know, I mean, we're breathing and the, the amount of people that are having, uh, that, are, that are contracting lung cancer who have never smoked has increased exponentially over the past 15 years. 
So we go from this theory of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, to one of strict products liability. What, what can possibly ethically justify this theory of strict products liability? So these women who take who have this, this cancer, basically what they're saying is, you drug manufacturers should never have manufactured this drug because it led to my, my getting sick. Well, you're ultimately arguing I should never have been born dead. How do we how do we possibly justify this? This is if this is highlighted by something called the Falls graph case. So we go from caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, to a theory of negligence. This is duty based. So negligence for for negligence product liability, what you have is you say first of all we have a duty. So we have a duty to manufacture things that are reasonably safe for the ordinary purposes in which they'll be they'll be used. So you have a duty, you have a breach of the duty. You have a breach of the duty. The breach of the duty leads to injury. And that breach and injury, the breach is the proximate cause. of the injury. So this is an elements test. Elements are hard, unlike factors tests. Duty, breach, injury, and the breach is the proximate cause of the injury. What is proximate cause? Well, normally cause is determined by what we call the but-for test, but sometimes you get things that are too attenuated that you can't say that it's but-for. So we have what's called legal causation which is proximate cause. So the but-for test, uh, you know, I mean, if you had an infinite regress, you would say, but for the fact your mother gave birth, you wouldn't have been injured in this accident, right? Well, that's too, that's, that's too attenuated for, for theories of negligence. And this is illustrated by the Falls Graph case. So Mrs. Falls Graph uh, versus the railroad is standing on a railroad platform waiting for a train. When a man enters the platform, he's running to catch a train he misses, he's going to miss the train. The train is pulling out of the station, but he, he leaps onto the, to the train. And as he's leaping onto the train, he starts to fall back. And a porter who works for the railroad gives him a little shove to get him on the train. He's carrying a package under his arm that's wrapped in some, you know, nondescript packaging. And that package as he's given this little shove by the porter, falls onto the railroad tracks. It turns out that it's, it's explosives. The explosives go off and the reverberation causes a set of scales on the other end of the platform to fall off the wall and hit Mrs. Falls' graph in the head. And she sues, who's she gonna sue? She's gonna sue the railroad company because they've got the deepest pockets. And she says, but for the act of your agent pushing this guy onto the train, he wouldn't have lost his balance, dropping the package, causing the explosion and the reverberation and the scales to hit me in the head. That's a but for test. And that's true. But for this act of him being shoved onto the train, none of the injury would have happened. And the court looks at that and says, hmm, that's too attenuated, right? That's not reasonably foreseeable. Who would reasonably foresee that a guy getting onto a train, being late and shoved, would be carrying a package of explosives that when it goes off, I mean, like, you could even see it if it were the shrapnel from the explosives, right? But, I mean, like, that's just nobody's going to foresee this. And so you don't have liability. So we go from caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, to duty, which is now we're going to say we can't just let people manufacture things without taking the ordinary care in the manufacturing process to ensure safety. But there's a limit to this, right? So when we test drugs, going back to the DES case, normally what we do is we test the drug by we give it to animals that are similar to humans, right? Usually like chimpanzees. 
and we see what happens. And if they get cancer, what would be reasonably foreseeable is that you use this drug and the women that you gave the drug to might come down with cancer, right? That would be reasonably foreseeable. But in the 1970s, nobody knew how much drugs crossed the placenta and how much they affected children. And so, you know, that's not reasonably foreseeable. So we come up with a, a later theory of liability, which is called strict products liability, which it doesn't rely on duty. It just says who's in the better position to pay. That's all. Strict products liability is purely utilitarian in that it says, look, you manufactured a drug, you manufactured a product, in this case, a drug, that drug had a negative impact on people and you made a lot of money and who's in the better position to pay for this? The women who suffered these injuries or the drug manufacturer? The answer is the drug manufacturer, usually. But don't they like see that? Like those companies they are like, <clears throat> if you put this out, you might hurt some people, but we're willing to pay that cost. Right. I mean, that that's, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a price of doing business now. Right. I mean, as, as a result, yes, drug manufacturers, and that's one of the reasons that drugs are so expensive because there are always, I mean, how many lawsuits do you hear advertised on television? You know, were you injured by talcum powder? Call 1-800-BAD-DRUG and we're going to sue the manufacturers of talcum powder, right? Because you know, you, you developed cancer as a result of this. So we've moved. Most of my students, when I talk about this, think the caveat enter is probably in a modern world a bad idea. In the past, again, going back to Henry Ford and the Model T, we could evaluate that. We, we sort of understood that if you had a crash, you know, at 20 miles an hour, it was going to be probably, you know, bad, but it's not going to be fatal. And by the way, it's probably safer than the horse, you know, because horses are inherently dangerous creatures. I know I, I, I was born and raised on a cattle ranch. I've had horses all my life. Um, they're dangerous. They, you know, they, they will try to get you off if they can, you know, and they have minds of their own. The car doesn't have a mind of its own. It's probably safer than the horse. And people could evaluate stuff when we had a much simpler society. Now it's harder to evaluate whether or not your car is safe. It travels at enormously rapid speeds, right? The speed limit on the turnpike is 75. And if it's 75, people are doing 85, right? I mean that, you know, it's just, these are in inherently dangerous products, but we go to the strictly utilitarian, which is who's in the better position to pay. Now, when we do the calculus on these things, one of the things that ends up happening is actually who ends up paying? Do companies actually end up paying for these, for these mistakes? No, we do. Why are drugs? So overall, if you, if you, you know, you all should have insurance, hopefully. How many of you have insurance? You have it, and when you go and you get your drugs, you have a copay, and it's expensive, right? I mean, we're all paying, and if you're paying for your insurance, we're all paying for things like the DES settlement because the companies are going to just pass on the cost of producing drugs the consumer in the next drug that they release. So we're all a little worse off as a result of these issues. So is there something that like the FDA could do to prevent companies from increasing their prices after they've just been sued? Not the FDA. Or whoever. Um, that's a, you know, complex situation. I mean, most other nations on the planet limit the amount. I mean, they they have nationalized healthcare systems, and so they're just going to tell the drug companies what they'll pay. And by the way, they accept that. And they, I mean, they they sell those drugs in Europe the same that they do here um, because they have nationalized health, and the and the 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 state just says you're not going to we're not going to pay more than this. So it's just capitalism. 
doing its finances. it's it is we have the most capital yes we nobody has a purely capitalistic system again if we did you would be going back to caveat emptor which is i could sell you anything that i wanted to sell, and i can't do that right i mean i, I can't just manufacture i i can't if you went back to 1889 to april 22nd 1889 all sorts of people made the land run and all sorts of people sold all kinds of things out of their wagon that were supposed to be you know products to cure everything from baldness to cancer and most of those products were probably toxic and you know but if you took them you should just beware that you know if you bought uh medicine from dr feelgood out of the back of a buckboard wagon well you know you get what you you get what you pay for we don't we don't let you do that anymore okay. yeah, right you have to you can't release drugs to the public without going through fda approval which is why if you're if you're taking something that's not a drug that's supposed to help with something else, there's always this disclaimer in the advertising. This is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any illness or disease. Right? They tell you this. Like, how many of you have watched the advertisements for Prevagen? And they'll say this is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent you know any any disease. Having memory loss, take Prevagen. An ingredient. I love this. The thing I love about the advertisement, Prevagen. An ingredient originally discovered in jellyfish. Like, I, I didn't know that jellyfish were highly sentient, you know, until I, if they had said an ingredient originally found in dolphins, I might think, you know, like uh, dolphins are pretty smart. They think that dolphins may be more intelligent than some humans. I have a friend, his name's Robert. I'm convinced the dolphins are smarter than him. I don't know if the dolphins are smarter than me. But I'm I'm convinced they're smarter than Robert. Yeah. I'm convinced my prairie dogs are smarter than Robert. And he's a nice guy, not terribly bright, but you know, um, huh? Bless his heart. Bless his heart. Yeah, you know, prairie dogs are really smart. They're really smart little creatures. So you know. I mean, they're, they're kind of amazing. We had a tree squirrel. We did all kinds of behavioral observations with the tree squirrel to see what she could learn. You know, the philosophers argue, for example, that animals are just going through instinct. It's purely instinct. So we get this, we have, we, we rehab a lot of animals and from time to time we can't release them. So we got this tree squirrel and she had these problems that we were never going to be able to release her. So we, kept, we had to keep her. So we started, you know, watching her doing these observational experiments. So we would put out this, we had this big basket kind of like this, and we filled it with nuts. And initially when we did that, she hid every single nut. Like for two weeks, we'd keep filling up the basket. And she would go and she'd like every single nut. She would work until that basket was empty and every single nut would be hidden every single day. At the end of two weeks, she started becoming more selective in the nuts she started realizing that, you know, she liked certain nuts better than other nuts. And the nuts she liked better directly corresponded with the prices in the grocery store. The more expensive the nut, the more she liked it. Like Brazil nuts were her favorite. Those are, and they're really, you know, she would like, she'd go through and she'd dig out all the Brazil nuts and she'd hide them. And then, you know, it got to the point where she would just hide them when she wanted to. And they, they, she, she knew there was always going to be a basket of nuts and she would, you know, she just sort of hide them when she wanted to. So she'd obviously learned, right, that, that there was not a scarcity in her little world of nuts. So, you know, we've got these, these creatures. If you had said, we discovered this, this, this enzyme in dolphins, I might think, but, you know, this, this enzyme in a jellyfish, and it's supposed to help with memory. And then, of course, they have the disclaimer. This is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Right. So you can't just manufacture things. And we come up with this theory of duty, which is that you have a duty to manufacture things so that it is it is suitable for its ordinary purpose or use to which it's going to be put into, which is one of the reasons why, you know, because of my profession, because the legal profession, when we got these chairs, I'd be willing to bet there was some sticker on it it's probably still on there that says, you know, like, do not stand on the chair. This is not. This is not a step stool, right? That's danger. Dangerous. Don't do that. Yes. In the case of like the jellyfish drug or whatever, uh -huh. is it unethical or illegal to sell a placebo? 
Is it? I I would say it's probably unethical okay. to. Is it illegal? Well, that depends. We don't really know. For example, um, what's in some of the? I mean, you know. Uh, let's look at this ad. Let me see if I can find it. Um, <laughs> oh, this one, I just this guy, this guy, I this guy just kind of creeps me out. So we'll watch it. <laughs> have you ever you, have you ever watched things that you just like you you just like love to hate this guy? I think he's creepy. He looks like Satan. That's what Satan looks like. Oh, what's wrong with the volume here? Oops, no. Literally, I mean, how do we know what the hell is in that? <laughs> and you're going to tell me that you can get an entire cabbage or something, you know, into one little. I, I mean, so, um, you know. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's like you probably need to. The overwhelming amount of evidence suggests that you need to get the nutritional products that you need through food. That it's very, I mean, most of the evidence suggests that with regard to vitamins and things like, I, we really don't know what the quality because it's not regulated by the FDA. So we don't really know what's in vitamins. They say that it's on this stuff. There are some truth and advertising laws that we've got out there. So you're not supposed to put stuff in there that's, that's not supposed to be in there. But do we really know? And the vast majority of evidence, this is, it's very difficult to determine these things, suggests that if you take multivitamins and stuff like that, that it's probably not being absorbed in your system. You're just peeing it out. It's just going straight through. It's being filtered through the kidneys and you're just, you're peeing it out. So, I, you know, I don't know. Can, I, that, that seems to me to be a placebo. You take balance of nature and all of a sudden you think you're, you're healthier and you have more energy. It's because Creepo there tells you that, that, that you've got yeah. more. I mean, would you trust that guy? I mean, he cut his onions and they were like this thick, and he was a dietetic and nutrition guy. Right. And I was like, yeah, like, where'd you, you learn learn how to cut? Where'd you learn the knife skills, buddy? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I've never, like, those are the worst knife skills I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so, you know, Our it's, I don't know. <laughs> Should you, you know, if you're buying this stuff, should you just sort of be aware that, that you have, you know, you're probably getting, you're probably getting scammed. Another area of interest with regard to this is the cost of these things. The cost of prescription drugs has gone up astronomically, and there are issues of fairness in pricing um, that we have to think about. So product sale. We're talking about Product safety. How do we know that a product is safe for its ordinary use in this day and age? How do we evaluate these kinds of things? 
the probability of risk. Yeah, but how do we know what the problem? I mean, do you really know what all the risks are with this? I mean, now we're saying things like, okay, I think they've come to the conclusion that you're probably not getting brain cancer from your cell phone. Literally, I mean, there were people that thought this. And there's this woman here in Edmond. She has a clinic. She's a naturopathic doctor down here on Broadway. It's uh, Full Circle Health. You can go by her. her. Her name is Mary Shrek. And by the way, I sort of wrote a case study based on her. She's one that thinks that you ought to pull all the amalgam fillings in your teeth out if you have them. So if you have fillings, you need to just go chisel those out because they're made with mercury and they're probably causing poison. I, yeah, she's got some real loopy ideas and the, the cell phone may be causing brain cancer, right? So we know that, but like, how about addictiveness? How many of you are addicted to this device? How many of you, if you leave it somewhere, start having a panic attack almost instantly if you don't have it? Um, I, I can tell you I do. Like if, if I, you know, if I don't have my cell phone, all of a sudden, how many of you have experienced phantom vibrations? All the time. Yeah. Okay. From, the, from the cell phone. This is not something that happened when I was a kid growing up that you had phantom viper. I mean, how many of you like think, I mean, it happens, I'll be holding it in my hand and think that it's going off because of this. Is that, is that safe? I think it actually is going off. You can't convince me that it's not. You think it's just going off to make sure that you're like paying attention? <laughs> yes, yes, it's like feels neglected. You think that they deliberately just have it go off randomly so that you will you will pick it up and pay attention? I mean, you are. That makes you'll, sense. No, yeah, you'll yeah. think about even like I don't know. I'm so much. You'll think about a product and then you'll be scrolling through Instagram and the next ad is what you were just thinking about. Like you wouldn't said it out loud or done anything, and then it's in your head. I'm well, telling you. Like an Apple Watch does not help with that because it vibrates for things that aren't even a notification. It makes you go check your phone and then later you keep thinking your watch is vibrating for yeah. something important and then it's not. It's like training you to instantly go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but like, I get those phantom vibrations whenever I don't even have my phone in my pocket. I do too. I yes, I do too. Like it, it will be yes. downstairs in the kitchen and I'll have these, these phantom vibrations. And just end up being my wallet. So let's consider again how these three theories, caveat emptor, negligence, and strict products liability, would, would deal with another case. This case involves a child named Willie Searcy. Willie Searcy is riding in the front of his father's Ford F-150 pickup truck in the Dallas, Texas area. What is the Ford F-150? Anybody know? It's a truck. It's a truck. Well, yeah, we can do that. It's a I mean, the, the, that's the obvious answer. What is the Ford F-150? It's like one of the Century. oldest, jankiest trucks. The oldest, jankiest truck. Like, if you, hear Ford, if you hear Ford F-150, like, you just think of, There's... like, some raggedy old countryside truck. Unless think, it's, like, I brand new, but more <laughs> more interesting. More often than not, it's older. It's the most bought car in America. It's what? It's the most popular. That's correct. The Ford F-150 is the number one selling truck for something like 30 years in a row running. So there are literally tons of these vehicles on the road, right? Willie Searcy is riding in the front seat of his father's Ford, or his stepfather's Ford F-150 pickup truck. He drops something on the floor, a, a piece of trash, and his stepfather tells him to pick it up. He is wearing a seat belt, which is good, although we've now started to manufacture cars because people don't wear seat belts so that they'll be safe in a crash. Even if you don't have your seat belt on, these are called things like Oh, airbags, which the first era, generation of airbags were really interesting. They were designed statistically for me. I, at the time that they released the airbags, I was 5'11". I've shrunk one inch. I'm now like 5'10 and a half um, because I, you're, you're, you do get shorter as you get older. Your, your vertebrae compress. And 
I broke a hip and they had to decompress it, which is means that now I have one leg that's shorter than the others. And, you know, things just, it, it's getting old as, as hell. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart, but um, I was 5'11 and I weighed forever and ever and ever until I broke my hip. I weighed something like 165 pounds, which is statistically average in the United States for a male. It's, it's actually, we've gotten heavier and we've gotten shorter um, in recent years, but I was statistically average and that's who the airbag was made for. If you were too short, uh, the initial airbags, they just pop your little head off and they, you know, they'd hit you in the head and they cause, uh, you know, neck injuries and things like that. So they've, they've modified all that so that it's good. That's as a result of strict products liability. So he's sitting in the front seat of his Ford, uh, father's Ford F-150. His dad tells him to pick something up. And exactly at that moment, he slams on into the back of another vehicle. And Cersei goes face forward into the dash and the front windshield. He broke... Uh, his back and his neck in something like six spots and he ended up being a quadriplegic. Now, the reason that he was allowed to slam into the front dash and windshield of his father's Ford F-150 was as a result of a design defect in the tension regulator of the shoulder belt harness in the pickup truck. You all have ridden in cars. Now, the first seat belts that we had when I was a kid growing up were just lap belts. And those were wonderful for holding your little body in place. But in, in many instances, they led to death because you would be cut in half or you would have internal bleeding as your body, the front part, the top part of your body was flung forward at a rapid speed. If you were in an accident over about 25 miles an hour, it would lead to that. So we started having these shoulder, or these shoulder harnesses. Now, the difference between the seatbelts when I was a kid and these shoulder harnesses and the modern seatbelt is that they allow you to move. And it was particularly important with regard to the shoulder harnesses because you need to be able to move when you're driving, particularly to be able to turn and see cars and look at the mirror and things like that. And so it has slack in it as long as you're applying a constant pressure to that tension regulator. What happens is the tension regulator engages if there is a sudden amount of pressure applied. But if you are applying a constant pressure and at, at the exact moment you slam into another car, the tension regulator won't catch because you've already started to apply pressure. It only catches if it's in the stop position and you immediately jerk on it, right? You all have done this in your car. You can, you can do this, go out in your car. So, of course, the family sues Ford because who's in the better position to pay for these injuries? It's Ford, right? Strict products liability, purely utilitarian. Who's in the better position to pay? Cersei or Ford? Ford was in the better position to pay, right? Ford fought the case for years and years and years. And they told Cersei's uh, attorney that if they couldn't come up with an uh, amount that was acceptable to Ford, they would simply keep appealing the case until the kid died and they would have to pay him nothing. And that's exactly what Ford did. Ford appealed and appealed and appealed. Finally, right before, days before the final, his initial appeal went up to the Texas Supreme Court and they gave Ford something that they didn't even ask for. A woman named Priscilla Owen, who was on the Supreme Court of Texas at the time and who had been elevated by George Herbert Walker, or George W. Bush to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals wrote the opinion. And she said that venue had been improper in the initial case in Ford versus Cersei, and she sent it back to the trial court. Three days before they had a verdict in the second trial court hearing, uh, in the second trial court case, Cersei's uh, attendant that was supposed to be changing his, his um, uh, ventilator had taken a phone call from somebody, her shift ended and she forgot to re-plug in the ventilator and he died at about 5 a.m. in the morning. So sue them now. What? So sue them now. So sue them now. Well, they don't have any money, right? You know, like the, the, the nurse who's changing the ventilator has probably not got deep pockets. But the case cost Ford millions and millions and millions of dollars. So when we say that strict products liability, and this is one of these cases that tugs at your heartstrings, 
Because here's a kid who, through no fault of his own, is injured by a product that Ford manufactures, and he's gone from being the star quarterback on his high school football team to living as a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. And who's in the better position to pay? Well, we say Ford is. But ultimately, if we went back in time, what was the average cost of a car? When I was a kid growing up, I was born in 1973. The average car price in 1973 was $4,500. How much is the average car price today across all models? Something like that. It's You're, you're about right. It's about $30,000, right? We've seen, if we had seen similar decreases in price, on things like computers, if we had applied those similar decreases to cars, a car today should cost about five bucks and run on a thimble of gas. When my mother bought her first computer for her office, for her business, her real estate business in Santa Fe, New Mexico, it was an IBM PC. The computer itself cost $1,500. The monitor cost $500 and the printer was $1,000. And the printer was so loud, you had to put it in a box. They made the soundproof box because it had a daisy wheel on it. You don't even know what these things are. Typewriters used to have, there were two types of type. Well, the oldest typewriters had one, when you would hit a key, a arm would go up and strike the page, right? You all have probably seen these. If you've seen a, a movie or a television show called Murder, She Wrote by that Snoopy old gal, I can't stand her. Um, Angela Lansbury and, and Murder, she wrote. She wrote on one of these manual typewriters, which it strikes. Well, then when we got electronic typewriters, they came up with a, it was a daisy wheel. So all of the alphabet was on this daisy wheel and the wheel would rotate when you hit a key and then it would have a hammer that would hit it and it would, uh, it would, it would make a, a, an imprint on the page. Well, the first printers that were, were, Type written quality had these daisy wheels and they would hit and they were so loud you had to put them in this box and they were a thousand dollars so the whole thing was you know like three thousand dollars to get a computer a monitor and a printer was like three thousand dollars how much can you get a windows box for today a couple hundred bucks right or less for the, the monitors these are cheap they used to be wildly expensive. Like these, this is all really, really cheap. And we've gone from $3,000 to being able to purchase all of this for a couple hundred bucks. Cars, on the other hand, have not gone that way. They've gotten more and more expensive and largely as a result of strict products liability because of cases like Cersei versus Ford or Ford versus Cersei. Who's ultimately paying for that? We are. We're ultimately paying the price for strict products liability. They're enormously expensive. Airplanes, as a result of the fact that, you know, they crash, are enormously expensive. A new Cessna 182, which is the aircraft that I have, is close <coughs> to a million dollars as a result of strict products liability. A Cessna Cirrus, or not a Cessna, a Cirrus um, aircraft is close to a million dollars. As a result of strict product. And they have to have a parachute now. Cirrus puts a parachute in their plane. Doesn't that make us all feel better? Yeah. <laughs> Turns out the parachute's not particularly helpful for what, what the problem is. So the Cirrus airplane um, cannot recover from a spin. That's how they, so they put it in a parachute uh, to satisfy the FAA so that they could get uh, airworthiness certificates on the aircraft. The problem is that the vast majority of spins that occur and are deadly happen at low level. And so the parachute wouldn't be useful because it wouldn't deploy in enough time, but we all feel better, right? So strict products liability, purely utilitarian, who's in a better position to pay. But ultimately the problem with this kind of utilitarianism is how do we do the calculus? When I bought my last pickup truck, it was $60,000. That's an enormous amount of money 
to pay for something, isn't it? We're all feeling the pain as a result of things like... Now, we could also talk about bad actors. If we talk about Ford's Pinto, for example, they had just calculated, by the way, that it was cheaper to pay people off than to fix the problem. The Ford Pinto was an enormously cheap little vehicle that they, that they manufactured. I think the idea was that they wanted to have a car that you could buy for less than $3,000. And so they manufactured this, this car. And it turns out that if you were in an auto accident in which the rear end was impacted, the car would just explode on impact. And gee, that was certainly bad, but Ford knew about this and they just calculated that rather than fixing the problem, it would just be cheaper to pay people off. Because who bought $3,000 vehicles? It wasn't the wealthy, right? They were poor. And we can calculate the, 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 you know, the value of a human life. What about pricing these products? We believe that we live in a capitalist society, and so we should let the free market price these products, right? We should have the invisible hand of the market should determine what the value is. The people who are willing to pay the most for something will put it to the highest and best use. Well, what happens? What's wrong with that? Less people are going to want to buy it. Okay, but why do we care? <coughs> like if if something is not capable of you know being sold um, because it's priced too high, that firm will go out of business. And why should we care about that? <coughs> may be like a necessity that we okay, like drugs right i mean if you were to contract for example hiv today and you don't treat it you will die right or the chances are pretty high the, the likelihood is pretty high that you will die we now have drugs that treat this the problem is that to bring those drugs to market the average person can't afford to pay for them right because they again going back to the des example, as a result of these problems that we have. And the problem with negligence in DES is that who would have foreseen in the 1970s that children of these women would be the ones that would suffer, the, and not all the offspring of these women, it was only the female offspring that developed cancer. It wasn't the male offspring, right? So we come up with this idea of strict products liability. This increases the cost of drugs. When they manufacture a drug, they know that at some point in time, they're likely to be sued. They're going to be held responsible under a theory of strict products liability. So we have to just increase the cost of the drug to cover these things. So how do we produce these drugs? This is what we call a market failure, because if you are HIV positive, for example, now, you are going to need these drugs to stay alive. Can you afford the drugs? Probably not. So we have insurance to cover the cost of those drugs. Again, the theory of insurance is that we spread the risk out among so that the pain is felt by everybody, right? So the healthy are paying a little bit more than they should for insurance as opposed to the unhealthy. But you know that should you become unhealthy and probably if you live long enough, all of us will have health problems at some point that your costs will be covered. But we do have these market failures, right? So we generally think about things in terms of the free market, but what do we do when we have market failures or, let's see, free markets. When we have these issues. Another issue, if you had purely capitalist uh, society without any regulation, you could end up with monopolies. And in fact, that's what you do end up with. And as a result of the fact that we are the most capitalistic nation on the planet, we have ended up with largely monopolistic pricing in many industries, haven't we? How many actually, or oligopolistic pricing in many industries, how many actual, for example, with regard to this device that we all think that we need to have, again, going back in time to 1973, when I was a kid growing up, you didn't have phones and well, people, some people had phones and cars. They were enormously expensive. They didn't work very well. They relied on radio transmission. 
And so it was, it was really, really bad technology. But we now all think that we have to have this device. How many actual providers of this device are there? Seven. A lot? I don't think there's a lot. There's, really? There's AT&T, there's Sprint. Okay, no, like this device well. itself. How many people actually manufacture this device? There's Apple. There's Samsung. There's Samsung. LG. Andrew, or there's LG, I guess, manufacturer. I mean, how many actual manufacturers of this device are there? There's three or four. It's, it's as many as I can count in my head. I mean, how how many, you know, how many people actually think that we need this device? Almost everybody now. I mean, technically, you know, nowadays. Can you can you get along without this device? Because there are only three or four manufacturers, they can they can set the price. Mm -hmm. How much is this? Again, cell phones are one of those things where computers have gone way, way down in price. Cell phones, not so much. The first cell phone that I had was, you know, I got it in high school. It was $1,000. What does a new iPhone cost? It's over $1,000. Now, nobody pays $1,000 for them, do they? Because... Mm -hmm. You, you know, trade it in, you get uh, the special deal, things like that. Um, is monopolistic pricing unfair? If you had a purely capitalist system, you could have monopolistic pricing and you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have issues with that. What happens in a monopoly? Well, we experience monopolies all the time. And as a result, there's not great, you know, they're limited. So if you buy electric, for example, if you live in Edmond, you have to buy electric from Edmond Electric. If you live outside of Edmond, you probably buy it from OG&E. How much incentive does OG&E have to, to provide great customer service? Almost none, right? Now they do, they do get on it when there's a storm, generally, but that's only because it's in their interest. If there's, if there's no power to your house, they're unlike cable, who cable continues to, even if they have a major outage, which they had a major outage in Guthrie two weeks ago uh, because of the fires that we had and it was burning their infrastructure to the ground, they, they were still charging the same, right? We generally think that that's a bad idea, so we regulate it and we don't allow for monopolies. What about price gouging? This occurs when you have emergency situations. So, for example, during hurricanes, the price of fuel in those areas, they'll start selling, you know, gas stations. Generally, we have laws against that as well, against price gouging. But what about an even more invidious form of ethics and pricing? Predatory pricing. Now, what is predatory pricing? Well, during the subprime mortgage crisis, of the 2010s, mortgage lending companies were going out and they were convincing people that they should take out loans that they really couldn't afford. Historically speaking, you had to have a fully documented loan. Freddie Mae and Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac regulated the industry and the home mortgage um, lending markets and they required full documentations of loans. What did that mean? That meant that if you wanted to buy a house when I was a kid growing up, your parents had to have 10% down and the bank would actually require, they would require three years of tax returns from your family. And they would actually go to your employers and they would say, how likely is Mr. or Mrs. Smith to continue being employed by you? It was a fully documented loan. When they deregulated the industry, they allowed for stated income to come in. So people could just say, I make $100,000 a year and they would give you these loans. And it was a house of cards because they made these loans to people who ultimately were not able to. And as long as the housing market is increasing in value, it didn't really matter because people could get out of the loans, they would sell the house, they would flip it before, for example, an adjustable rate mortgage would kick in the arm and, and they, would, they would sell the house, right? But it all came crashing down when the housing market failed. So predatory pricing is one of those things. Now, again, from a utilitarian perspective, this is hard to calculate. How do you calculate the pain caused by the collapse of the home mortgage industry? More people now own homes as a result of that cheap lending 
than it did in the past, but at what cost? I am out of time, so we'll stop there. I know that I am behind on grading and we had two exams that hit back to back. I'm gonna try and get caught up. I had a USCA visit, then CSI, and now I've got a USCA's uh, annual meeting. Um, I'm leaving today, but I will try and get exam two graded. Um, and your, did I get the article reviews graded? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll try and get that done as well. All right, have a good afternoon. I will see you in a week. Yeah, there was a uh, discussion. Like, that's kind of what it is. Uh, yeah, I said, said because we got off, I would uh, count those as bonus if you wanted to do them. Okay. Sadness. Sadness. Yeah. It's happening. I do want to talk about your work. Your name is so fun. Your family is so nice.